Dear friends, welcome to e-Patshala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Peet Pune. Today, we are going to look at a module called Civil Society, Political Society and Reproduction of Class Structure within the paper called Political Sociology. As the name suggests, we are going to look at how class is reproduced in a capitalist society and what is the role of the civil society in forging a kind of an ideology that brings about self repression and what is the role of political society in trying to emancipate the masses from this kind of deprivation. Early liberal thought on civil society and political society. Among the 17th century philosophers, Locke's conception of civil and political society follows from the theory of social contract, which lays out the principle of individuals forsaking some of their liberties to the sovereign state in return of protection of their liberties. This move from natural social order, where individuals defend their own person and property to a system where consented upon authorities establish and enforce the rule of law gives birth to civil society. This civil society made up of consenting individuals is at odds with monarchy. Unlike Locke, Rousseau sees the early period of state of nature as romantic age of peace and absence of possessions. As societies get established, contestations over property require the rule of law. Civil society gets established in order to protect property and maintain peace. Tocqueville in the 19th century sharpened the discourse on civil society by arguing that it is this that fosters a community in an otherwise individuated modern life. It can be effective to keep a check on despotism and allow individual liberties to flourish. In these discussions of civil society, speak at a generalized level of the public within a sovereign, but they mark the transition towards modern society with legal and executive systems. At the core of these ideas are individuals carrying rights and liberties and subjects to an established system of law, an important aspect of liberal thought. Further, in this discussion we will look at Gramsci's conception of civil and political society, wherein the central aspect is not liberal individuals, but systems of state that maintain class structure. Marxist perspective, coercion and consent. Before discussing Gramsci's idea on the subject, just a short note on Marx's idea of civil society. Civil society is seen as characteristic of modern bourgeoisie society in Marx, where all previous ties of community, guilds, etc. have been broken down. Individuals entering economic competition from the civil society with abstracted objectives and with a clear distance and non-interference from the state. Here, the economic role of individuals takes primacy. This relation to economic relations to the base differentiates civil society from political society, where the latter is seen as a part of a superstructure along with aspects of ideology, culture, etc. According to Gramsci, the role of civil society is more complex. It is in the economic non-state sphere of civil where hegemony of the ruling class is organized. More than the distinction between state and civil society for Gramsci, the relationship between the two is important. Civil society consolidates the hegemony of the state and through that the hegemony of the ruling classes. The state consolidates the hegemony of the ruling classes by its coercive power. The aspect of coercive power is captured by the term political society in Gramsci. Civil and political societies together form aspects of the state and its apparatus through which hegemony is exercised, although they must not be understood as the same or subsumed under the state. For Gramsci too, civil society exists in the base, constituted by economic relations and political society as an aspect of the coercive power of the state exists in the superstructure. But moving beyond this differentiation, it is both political and civil society that gives the state its distinct nature of exercising coercion 
and also building consent. This operation of hegemony is important to legitimize the reproduction of class structure. Like Gramsci, another Marxist thinker concerned with how class structure is reproduced in society is Louis Althusser. He took a closer look at ideology to explain how conditions for production are reproduced or how the structures that enable capitalist production get reproduced. The state in all of this enables the hold of the ideology that justifies these structures. The state ensures this through repressive state apparatus of punishment, violence, etc. and ideological state apparatuses of church, school, etc. which consolidate consent for this ideology. The central point in bringing these thinkers is to bring out the question of reproduction of class structure in society. Going back to civil society, a useful example for understanding its operation is the media, especially the contemporary movement more than ever before. Media disseminates the ideas of consumerism, militarization, conflict politics, etc. in ways that endorse the ideology of the ruling class. Opinions of critique have to sustain on independent initiatives. Today, we are one step ahead in the process of media generating opinions and consent as the ownership of these media houses to lies with the same minority of corporations which form the ruling class. Partha Chatterjee, Political Society. Now the discussion will move to the work of Partha Chatterjee. Chatterjee has worked with the concepts of political society and civil society to understand contemporary politics in India. The overarching frame is of mapping the trajectory of modernity and democracy in India with a special focus on politics at the local level. As mentioned earlier, the cornerstone of liberal thought and also of modern nation states organized by capitalism are sovereignty of the state and rights of individuals. Chatterjee argues that rights of citizens in modern nation states are defined by ideas of freedom and equality. These two ideas were mediated by property and community. While property addressed questions of freedom and equality among individuals, the community was to address these questions at a collective level. Property and community defined the conceptual parameters within which the political discourse of capital proclaiming liberty and equality could flourish. The civil society, individuated by such citizens, was to check absolutism and help society progress from pre-modern ideologies, especially on the question of transition to capitalism in non-Western world, even from a Marxist perspective, the role of civil society in advancement towards modernity and protection of freedom and community was recognized. Chatterjee, however, brings out the distinction between citizens and populations. While citizens are the theoretical category of right-bearing individuals who participate in the activities of the state, populations are governed vast groups of classifiable people who are provided welfare by governmental tools which are also vast networks of surveillance. The shift which is borrowed from Foucault marks the trajectory of the 20th century where participatory citizenship has been replaced by technologies of governing. What effect does this have on democratic politics? It is here that the distinction between civil society and political society becomes relevant. Civil society for Chatterjee is understood in the Marxist conception of civil society as bourgeois society, using it in the Indian context as an actually existing arena of institutions and practices inhabited by a relatively small section of people whose social location can be identified with a fair degree of clarity. In terms of the formal structure of the state as given by the constitution and the laws of society is civil society. Everyone is a citizen with equal rights and therefore to be regarded as member of civil society. However, this is an ideal description. The actual arena of contestation between the state and population is one where the populations have only a tenuous presence as citizens and do not quite engage with the state as members of civil society and yet are completely outside the domain of politics. Tools of governability like policies and various government agencies bring them into a relationship with the state. 
these are not relations as defined by constitutional mandates of civil society and yet they have gathered a process and norms around them over the years. Chatterjee takes us to the distinction brought out by the work of subaltern studies in anti-colonial movement between the organized elite domain and unorganized subaltern domain, the latter of which was explained away as pre-political. To understand the dynamics between the elite and subaltern politics in contemporary times, he introduces the concept of political society. Gramsci also uses this term, but according to Chatterjee, while he equates it with the state, initially he later goes into interventions which are beyond the domain of the state. A shift of the state towards being a facilitator of welfare through governmental tools and sometimes even aided by non-governmental agencies and shifting terrain of political mobilization which are even transient like cultural events, religious events, popular culture, etc. have together enabled the emergence of political society. Often, it even goes against the grain of modern practices and ideology. An example of this mobilization of people often squatting in urban areas forming slums. The struggle with municipal authorities against demolitions, the shadowy role of political parties in these struggles and the resilience of the people in rebuilding their lives and constantly negotiating with authorities are clearly different from the bourgeoisie nature of civil society and yet is a political contestation with the state. To clarify this with an example, he describes a shanty town near a railway track in Kolkata. This was settled soon after the Bengal famine of 1943, when many people came from rural parts and settled there. After the partition, many refugees from the then East Pakistan also came and settled there. Slowly, some men started to take leadership in organizing this place and also charging rent from new settlers. These leaders also established political links and prevented attempts by local administration at demolishing their shacks. By the 80s, while further attempts at demolishing the shacks by railway authorities were foiled, a local welfare association also got formed. Through this, funds were collected, medical centers, libraries, etc. were opened up. The government scheme for health and literacy of children was introduced with of its centers being opened in the colony. The collective which is formed in the colony often acquires services from the state and its agencies through methods that fall in the domain of illegal. The tapping of electricity is one such example. Chatterjee argues here that while at one level the struggle is to be recognized as a population group which is then the target of the state policies there is another equally crucial part of politics of the governed to give to the empirical form of a population group the moral attributes of a community. While comprising of communities across castes and the people living in the settlement providing easy categories of governability, they see themselves as one big family. The association that they have formed by no means is a civil society group with legitimate demands from the state. The place itself is a settlement colony. The basic premise of this place is based on illegality. The claims made on behalf of the association invoke the responsibility of the state to provide basic services to its people. These are clearly political claims, but they are also dependent on many contextual factors. Many of the examples of political society come from struggles of population for livelihood. In 2008 article, Chatterjee classifies peasantry, artisans and petty producers in the informal sector as comprising of political society. He argues that in the last three decades, the role of the state has shifted towards a more penetrative one, providing basic facilities like health, education, etc., either itself or through other agencies. This expectation from the state is accompanied by a greater disposition of those who form the class of peasantry and artisans through the process of capitalist growth and accumulation. Schemes like the Mahatma Gandhi National Employment Scheme, the Public Distribution Scheme of Food for the Poor, the Midday Meal Scheme for the Children in School, etc. are all efforts towards this reversal in his formulation. 
while the state cannot provide all of its population with facilities, there is also a calculation of political expediency in the provision of basic facilities. Members of political society then have to pick their way through this uncertain terrain by making a large array of connections outside the group with other groups in similar situation, with more privileged and influential groups, with government functionaries, perhaps with political parties and leaders. They often make instrumental use of the fact that they can vote in elections, but the instrumental use of the vote is possible only within a field of strategic politics. Chatterjee clearly sets this apart from the bourgeois civil society with its legal constitutional space. He sees this as a terrain of politics that do not form citizens of the state but its population. Drawing parallels from the subaltern studies, distinction of elite and subaltern anti-colonial politics, the engagement with modernity which is the bedrock of civil society gets complicated here with the mobilizations which are more communitarian and along the lines of not just strict party lines but many overlaps of culture, kinship, religion, popular culture, etc. In more recent formulations, Chatterjee has argued that interests of political society such as that of landed elite, local traders and producers play a role in electoral mobilizations. This stands along with the influence of a capitalism dominated bourgeoisie civil society. As such, the older model of agricultural elite, the capitalists and bureaucracy as three dominant classes operating in a space supervised by a relatively autonomous state has been replaced by the dominance of corporate capitalist class in the post-liberalization phase. To this extent, Chatterjee associates civil society with the corporate capitalist class and political society with non-corporate informal sector. Civil society is where corporate capital is hegemonic, whereas political society is a space of management of non-corporate capital. The material conditions and aspirations of the middle class and elite classes is linked to the rise of corporate capital. As he argues and goes along to claim, legal rights of proper citizens to impose civic order in public places and institutions and to treat the messy world of informal sector and political society with a degree of intolerance. The non-corporate political society also has its roots and processes of mobilizations mostly for, for livelihood issues operating within the market and government regulations. Many leaders in these groups are potential local politicians and they work with innovation. Such groups are more powerful in urban areas as compared to rural areas. On the other hand, these groups and their mobilizations still exclude many. Chatterjee's particularly refers to non-agrarian, lower castes and adivasis who depend on forests. Political society and electoral democracy have not given these groups the means to make effective claims on governmentality. In this sense, these marginalized groups represent an outside beyond the boundaries of political society. He concedes that while these groups mobilize on grounds of discrimination and difficulties in sustaining livelihood, they do not envision structural changes and transformation of political power. The only group that is envisioning transformation is the capitalist class to which other must respond as they move from stagnation to uninhibited accumulation. To summarize, in contemporary India, civil society and political society are bound by the logic of the state reversing capitalist growth and accumulation by means of social sector expenditure through which the state partially sustains the livelihood of the poor and the overall system of capitalist accumulation is negotiated and maintained. Critic of Chatterjee's formulation of political society. Several scholars have engage Chatterjee's conceptualization of civil and political society, especially as it attempts to theorize the contemporary movement of local level politics in India. The following sections will look at some of these responses to his argument. Sarkar brings out the emphasis on the transgression of the legal in Chatterjee as a problematic. While the legal system is full of contradictions, 
the excessive emphasis on it and its transgressions cannot be the sole roots of doing politics. This extends into the emphasis on legal and statist categories of understanding in Chatterjee. It is only in negotiation with the state that the terrain of civil or political society is recognized, whereas the emphasis of the Foucauldian perspective, governmentality, is also as much about the self and subjectivity in this negotiation. Also, the arguments towards political society do not look at people's resistance which have taken a legal route and yet move towards state's guarantees of livelihoods, the dignity as in the case of legislations like the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Scheme, RTI, etc. Babiskar and Sundar problematize the op oppositional categories set up by Chatterjee as in corporate, non-corporate, civil society, political society, etc. In the case of accumulation of capital, the interlinkages between corporate and mercantile instead of non-corporate capital is not one of opposition but mutual support. In fact, particularly in the sector of welfare measure for agriculture, much of the use of resources is directed towards the market by local agents even if it crushes the small subsistence farmers. Bhavaskar and Sundar take most strongly to the opposition of civil and political society wherein the former is argued to be working in the terrain of civil mechanisms, rights and legality. Political society is imagined to be negotiating with law, flourishing in a messy terrain of illegality. They argue that it is in fact the bourgeoisie civil society emerging from the capitalist class which flouted laws, taken advantage of established systems, resorted to violence and engaged in most uncivil practices. Examples from Singur where the state government evicted peasants to allow Tata Motors to establish a production plant. When the peasants resisted, they were beaten up, raped and killed. Militarization in the Adivasi regions of Central India for extraction of natural resources and several other reveal the illegality of the capitalist class and the state's endorsement of it. They argue for a more complex history of the growth of corporate capitalism in India. Shah critiques strategy at many levels. He expresses his discontent at the use of class as a central axis of power by Chatterjee when it is fairly established in Marxist tradition that caste is an equally potent axis of power. Caste, region, ethnicity, religion, etc. have been grounds of mobilization in the same period that Chatterjee is looking at. While these aspects find mention in his work, they do not measure up as fault lines along which analysis is built. Similarly, the peasantry in his work is an undifferentiated mass when in fact the agrarian sector has been highly stratified during and even before the colonial period. Here too caste has been an important factor of material stratification. The subsistence self-sufficient agriculture that Chatterjee talks about which has changed a few decades ago according to him has in fact not existed in the simplistic fashion for a really long time now. Shah traces social sector expenditure as a phenomena which has taken roots much before the liberalization period. In fact, the unrest of the 80s had prompted the Indira Gandhi government to take many steps towards welfare measures for the poor. If anything, the state has abdicated itself from the responsibilities as visible in the intensification of non-state actors-led programs in rural areas, those spaces where the state needs to intervene most urgently. Finally. John and Deshpande point out the lack of engagement with the texts on growth of capitalism in agriculture wherein processes of accumulation have not generated the results that older conceptualizations of capitalist accumulations assume. Unlike Shah, they find programs like MNREGS, afterthoughts posed on the agenda, electoral compulsion. In any case, they argue that Chatterjee's analysis of these policies suffer from equating intentions with outcomes. The need to reverse the processes of accumulation by schemes for the poor might be conceived as such, but they are not working out in that way on the ground. They take up Chatterjee's argument of lack of transition or transformation 
as perceived by political society groups. They wish to know the implication of the lack of these narratives and or are they being written in different scripts, for example, the aspirational move to urban areas by rural youth. The content that although the explication of the political society theory is based on thin description of urban poor, the rural poor is dealt with really broad strokes. Further, the exclusion of the poor, further the exclusion of the people from political society is only briefly mentioned. What would be important in this perspective is an analysis of the processes through which this exclusion happens. Also, this exclusion is not a monolith in their opinion and needs further probing. In this regard, the struggle of Adivasis and also the Maoists in some of the most naturally abundant regions which have seen worst forms of primitive accumulation and state repression could be a shadow zone that needs more probing. A similar shadow zone is migration of Adivasi girls, women to urban areas to find jobs as domestic workers. The nature of the work which is isolated and framed in ideas of servitude leaves them out of the mobilization of political society. The exclusion of Muslims in the contemporary situation where they are being pushed out of a mainstream politics by alienation and deprivation is yet another set of experiences of a group which are not articulated in the way Chatterjee imagines political society. These examples illustrate the disaggregation of exclusions of political society which along with a better grasp of change in rural India are important if Chatterjee's ideas have to be made more rigorous in their grasp of on contemporary India. To conclude therefore, we have seen how Partha Chatterjee's arguments take us from how civil society in India was construed through the idea of a bourgeoisie led dominant and hegemonized kind of an ideology and how there are spaces of contestation through the formation of political and citizenship based kinds of spaces. However, we have also seen Partha Chatterjee was critiqued on several grounds.